Let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to come together. Lord, I just ask that everybody's ears be open and their eyes be open to see the truth of your word as we study it today, Lord. And as we learn more about how to understand your word and how we're supposed to live our lives, that we understand that it's not about us. It's all about your glory. And the best way to show your glory be manifest in the world is for us to go teach other people about you so that they can have a relationship, so that they too can glorify you. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, your homework assignment was Psalm 90, verse 10. So if everybody will look on the handout so you don't have to flip through your Bible, what I have for you there is parallel passages of both the King James Version and the NIV. The NIV, pretty much representative of all of the modern versions that have been written since the beginning of the 20th century, to show you how it makes a difference which interpretation that you look at. And we're going to first look at the NIV version because I imagine that most of you probably have studied this in the modern version. And then we'll go through and look at the same passages through the King James and see where we end up at the end of the day. Let me just quickly read out of the NIV verse 10 out of Psalm 90, and then I want you to tell me your interpretations of what it is that we just read. So it says, Our days may come to 70 years, or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. What interpretations did we come up with that passage? What do you think that means? Uh, wrote down that uh, we as uh, believers in Christ shall live a long life of 70 to 80 years if we have the strength and continue our belief in God, but uh, non-believers shall pass, pass uh, quickly as uh, we are swept up to heaven. Anybody agree or disagree with that interpretation? I agree, but I assume the passage to be prophetic because in the Old Testament men lived so much longer. And I also looked at it that the Lord counts sees a day as a thousand years and vice versa and again about the labor and sorrow but I still didn't feel I had enough so I went to verse 12 and I thought that that helped me because I think if you read a verse you kind of need to read all around it and that was a reminder to me how short my days are and the interpretations that you are coming up with are correct based on the version of the Bible that you have yes ma'am They get weary in prayer, or they get weary if they constantly pray. And it almost tells us, like, no matter how old you are, do not get weary, turn it over to the Lord. And all of those are interconnected, and there's nothing wrong with the interpretation that you have. The problem is with the version of the Bible you have. That's the problem. It has nothing to do with what you said. Absolutely zero. First, I'm going to go through the NIV version of it. And Sam, you made an important point. I gave you one verse, but when you did it, hopefully you read the entire psalm because you have to be careful not to take any verse out of context and you have to see the parameters around it because that kind of explains it. One of the problems that people have of biblical interpretation is they will read one particular verse and it appears to say one thing, but it has nothing to do with the point that they're trying to make. Satan would pull out scriptures all the time, and the best example was in the 40 days of the wilderness when Jesus was out there being tested. He was throwing out scriptures, and Jesus didn't say, that's not what the Bible says. But what he did was he put it into context and pulled in the scriptures to say you're twisting the meaning of what it means, Satan. That's not what it means. And that's one of the problems. Calvinism historically has done that in numerous areas. And as I explained to you, any theology that you come up based on the Bible, why it's so difficult to do is it covers literally thousands and thousands of passages, the entire Bible. But if one scripture contradicts what it is that you're trying to put forth, it can't be of God. There are no mistakes with God. So when people always argue about Calvinism, and there are thousands of verses that they quote, I can just rattle off hundreds of them to you, but always when I debate someone who's a Calvinist, I always pull up one scripture. And the very premise of it is, Calvinism, is that before God chose you through grace and mercy, he decided that some will go to hell, some will go to heaven, and if you're in the club, great. If you're not, too bad. But the good news is, because you're sitting and listening to somebody teaching about the Bible, you must be in the club, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So if you're in the church, you're one of the lucky ones. But the scripture I always come up with is just one. 
The Father desires that no man should perish. How do you get around that? There is no some do, some don't. It's all men. So that's very easy. So the problem of Calvinism, they could reconcile that verse. Now there's a lot of other verses they can't reconcile either, but that's one. Until they can get over that stumbling block, our discussion is over. Come back to me when you study it up a little bit more and we'll talk, keep on talking there. People get mad when I respond that way, but do you realize it's a waste of my time arguing with you until you get past that scripture there because that's a foundational belief. Well, not only is that a problem if you have the correct version of the Bible, when I say correct, it's the best interpretation because even though I believe the King James is, it's not perfect. There are mistakes within it. Not as far as the theology, but some of the grammatical, and transcribing errors that are in there, which is to be expected over thousands of years. There may be a disagreement as to articles, the, or whatever, but ultimately the basic theology. But if you have a modern translation, not only do you have potential interpretation problems and transcribing errors, but you also have a theology that's thrown in before the interpretation started. The King James was interpreted just from one language to another, and then after they interpreted it, they went back and read it and says, ah, this is what it says. With the modern translations, they already decided what they wanted it to say, and they already had the King James to look at, so then they started tweaking areas that didn't match up with what they believed as far as the theology. That's why there's differences. And we went over Ephesians 4.30 and explained to you how you could have two opposite meanings there, and it was what seals you, the Holy Spirit or the fact that you don't grieve the Holy Spirit two different concepts. So they had to tweak it to make it fit in with what they did. Well, let's look over at the NIV, and we're just going to go through it as if you were reading it and studying. So let's go at the beginning. And at the very beginning of it, it says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. So who wrote this psalm? Moses. Moses. So it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. So reading that sentence, what would you say that that says? But specifically, it talks about dwelling place in all generations. So when we're talking about dwelling, it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. First of all, let me back up a little bit. Who do you think this scripture is about? Now, your interpretation that you told me generically, who were we talking about? What group of people were we talking about? When you just described what your interpretation, who were you talking about? Jews. No, you weren't. You were talking about us, were you not? Because it's that we live to be 70 years and we get weary, we get to, it's we. You're thinking of the church. It has nothing to do with the church, it has nothing to do with us Gentiles. You're right, it has to do with the Jews, and there's a hint that it has to do with the Jews because who wrote it? Moses. There wasn't no church at that time, guys. He didn't even know that the church, because the church is a mystery that Paul told us about that didn't even come about until after the death and resurrection of Christ. It has nothing to do with it. He wasn't thinking about a Gentile at all. He was thinking about Jews. Well, he could think some Gentiles, because there were some Gentiles who were Jews, because remember that when he did the covenant with God, he said, all of you who are your descendants and also all of those who are in your household. So there were Gentiles that were part of the original Jews there when they were circumcised at that point. So you could could become a Jew, but what would you have to do in the Old Testament? You'd have to be circumcised and start following the law of Moses and Abraham as far as that's concerned. We get that first hint from the very beginning of it. It's kind of telling us what group of people we're talking about. So it doesn't have anything to do with the church at all. So that could tell you that, whoops, we got a problem here, right? Our interpretation is going to change a little bit just based on that. But it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. In the dwelling place, he was the tabernacle. People would go for him for protection and guidance. And specifically, remember Moses just wandered through the desert, and he literally had a tabernacle, that the holy, most holies, and God was with them. And he says, you've been with us through all generations. When you see the word generations, what do you think it means? What do we typically think in 21st century when we read the word generations? We're thinking of people groups and going from generation to the next generation onward. It has nothing to do with that directly. Indirectly, it has to do with an indeterminate period of time. When we get to the King James, I'm going to show you how I know that, but it has to do with that. But you're making the right assumption based on what you're reading. You're interpreting it the way that you would read literally 21st century literature, and you're going to put it in the context of the words that you know and the definitions that you go by today. So it's very perfectly clear that the interpretations that you gave me just a few minutes ago are the way that you went there. And I understand it. And I'm showing you how, if you read this, this is what you come up with. It says, Before the mountains were born, or you were brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So you said that means that God has always been, He was, He is, and He forever will be. And it says that He created two things based on the NIV. What did He create? All things. 
but specifically, what does the language say in verse 2? Before the mountains were born, and before you brought forth the whole world. So the mountains are pretty clear. Those are those big outcroppings that go up into the sky, okay? And we also see that we have the whole world. And based on 21st century interpretation, what does world mean today? When you say the word world, what are you thinking of? The world. The physical earth is what you're thinking of. So keep on going. It says, you turn people back to dust and return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight or like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. So it says that people turn back to dust, you mortals. So what is it talking about here? talking about death and again based on this interpretation I understand where you got your interpretation from okay so it says you people turn back to dust and because we're talking about collectively generations and we're thinking of all mankind based from the way that we set up we're talking about based on this reading the death of all humanity right because all mortals ever since Adam since we sinned in the garden we've all had a fallen body and eventually we died and then we switch subjects. We talked about the fact that God was always here and that he brought forth the planet and the mountains in it and that we are mortals. And then it switches over, which is kind of strange because it's kind of a totally unconnected thought here. And it goes on to say, a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. What does that have to do with anything you just read? Anybody tell me how that's connected? Is it connected? I just am connecting everlasting to time so a thousand years it just fits that way for me so we're looking about how god essentially deals with time everlasting to everlasting means eternity to us but to him it's really a short period of time even though it seems a very long time to us even our lifetimes seem like a very long time of 70 80 years etc but as far as a discussion that we're talking about that we're mortals and that we're going to die does god's interpretation of time really have anything to do with that at all you got two disconnected thoughts here, okay? We're looking at it, but is it really connected? The answer is no. And it says, yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like new grass of the morning, and the morning it springs up new, but by evening it's dry and withered. So those verses kind of match back up with verse 3. That's talking about you're mortal and you turn to dust. It's kind of describing that. But in between, there's this disconnected verse that has nothing to do with anything we're talking about, and it has to do with time, right? So when you read this, I know what you did. As you said, kind of connected it into everlasting, but you just kind of skipped over it and you didn't really think about it. Just kind of bypassed that scripture there. Is any jot or tittle in the Bible wasted? Yeah. Is he just filling up space? So there has to be a reason why he threw that in there, but it's not really connected with what you just read. So you see a quandary that we're running into right here. We're going to see this even more in a minute. And it says, In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it's dry and withered. So your life is, you grow up and you die and you wither away and that's all there is. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Now we're totally shifting gears again, are we not? Before we're talking about death, we're talking about creation. Now we're talking about the actions of man. They're all valid points, but are they interconnected? It's almost like Moses was just praying, all of a sudden a thought would pop in his head, totally disconnected. Boom, boom. Oh, I was talking about that. Boom. I want to talk. Boom. I've got a picture of Moses praying out in the wilderness by himself to God out loud. Who's writing this down? Well, ultimately, David probably ended up writing it down, passed through, or maybe Moses did, and it was just a separate letter that eventually got to David, but David kind of put the Psalms together. But the point is, this almost seems like a bullet list point, doesn't it, when you're going through it? It's talking about creation. It's talking about death of man. It's talking about now the actions of man, etc. But they're not really related. They're all valid points, and through our study of the Bible, we agree with everything that you said. All the points are valid points based on what we've read. But for a 17 verse psalm is just not really connected is it it's like point a point b point c point d point e they're all valid but normally doesn't a particular psalm cover a particular subject it's not a bunch of ideas thrown in together but that's what we're finding so you're starting to see a little bit of a problem here that just doesn't make sense if you didn't have the context of the rest of the bible in your training would this make sense to you because they're just points that are being thrown out to you? Do you see what's happening here? And it says, 7, We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in light of your presence. All of our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a month. Does everybody die because of their sin? Are there obedient, faithful Christians who make it home to be with God and yet who die? 
There's no perfect Christian. All men die because we're in fallen bodies. Adam and Eve sin in the garden, and the consequence of what we've got a fallen body because of that. We don't live forever. Even if you are holy and righteous and do everything that God says, if you are not raptured out of here, will you physically die? Yes. It has nothing to do with your sin. Holy people die. So that's not the issue there. Now, if you sin, that may speed up your death, and you may be terminated quicker than what you would have. If Jesus stayed on the earth and was not crucified, he would have died a man because he was in a fallen body. If he was in a perfect body, would he be subject to all the same temptations that we are? No. And the scriptures clearly teach he had all the same temptations that we did, okay? His belly grumbled when he was hungry, just the same way that we do. When people were mean to him and unfair, his human emotion would have been raised up. Did he show anger at times? It wasn't unjust anger, but he felt anger and emotions and all of that. So he wasn't in a perfect body, but he knew how to deal with the fallen body and how to overcome it because he did the things of God. But now we're talking about here. And it would appear that those are connected, but they're really not connected because one is just physical mortality. The second is disobeying and rebellion to God and the consequence of sin. So now we're in our fifth subject, and we're only into six, seven verses already. All of our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. So based on what we've read so far, it would make sense that we live to be 70 years is what God kind of designs us, and if we have enough strength, we might make it to 80. The problem with that is is, according to our insurance tables, what's the average lifespan today? 85. For women, it's 82. For men, it's 78. So men, this verse works. For women, does it work today? No. Do people live beyond 82? That's the average. I'm reading the paper. There's somebody who just died 116 years old or whatnot. So is God just generically speaking, or is that number specifically? Well, if you're in the modern translations, and especially if you don't necessarily believe, as we do in a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial belief system, and that you're amillennial, does a thousand years really mean a thousand years? No, it's an indeterminate period of time Christ is going to come back. We believe that Christ is going to specifically rule on this earth for a thousand years, right? So we've had two situations here. We've always said that a thousand years in your sight are like a day to the Lord. They're specific. Now, if that was specific, and is it specific, does God see a thousand years as a day, or does he see a thousand years as six days? Or is it three days? Or is it two days? Which is it? If you open up the door to interpretation, it could be anything. But it's pretty specific. He sees a thousand years as a day. Equivalent, okay? Day equals a thousand years. If you're doing a math equation, you'd see that. So if that's the case, would that give an indication that God's been specific here? Is 70 or 80 an indeterminate period of time, or is it specifically a time frame that he's talking about? You, whoever you are, are going to be here 70 years, and if there's enough strength, you may make it to 80. Not going to make it to 81. You may make it to 80. It's a specific time frame. So one, we've already established that Moses is the one that gave this. There was no church at that time. He didn't even know the word church, didn't know what a church was. And he wasn't talking about Gentiles. And yet we're interpreting this that generally speaking today in America, we're going to live 70, 80 years, give or take a little bit, and then we'll be taken out of here. Do you see where we're starting to run into some problems with that interpretation there? Everybody with me still? So going on. 11. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Fetch us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Well, he's telling us to number our days. Can we number our days if it's an indeterminate period of time? Your 70 years may be my 80. What, the new 80 is now 70? I mean, we have that language today. So you can't do what we're asking him to do unless you have a set period of time here. But now we're talking about his wrath of God and we're asking to do things. All of these points are valid again but are they interconnected? There are different thoughts that are just being strung together. So if someone, whoever interpreted this, said, oh, I can show you where I kind of got this idea from, they can show me different scriptures. And says, yep. And I'd say, yeah, you're right. That scripture does say that. But here he is piecing it. They're just ad hoc thoughts that are being thrown in together under this interpretation there. And then it says, relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servant. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. 
Now those last six or seven verses are all interconnected and it's Moses basically asking him, God, to deal with us. But why was all that stuff before that really has nothing to do with that? It's a valid point and it is prayers that many people have said, but does it really have anything to do with the first 10 verses? It's like just a different section that was just kind of thrown in there. So what I'm showing you is, do you see from what I pointed out to you, there's some problems with that interpretation. Is everybody in agreement? Does anybody disagree or feel that I'm not making a valid point of what I just said? Does it make sense what I'm telling you there? That It's not that these points aren't valid, but they're not connected. They're just thoughts that are just one after another that are kind of sewn together, and here you have Psalm 90. But we know that our Psalms have continuity to them, and each one of them is a different thought. Now, Psalm 90 may be related to Psalm 91, but still it's pointing to different thought. Normally, it's from the beginning to the end. Was this Psalm read in the temple by the scribes? or? I'm sure it was. Uh, did the lay people understand it? They did, but they weren't getting this version of the Bible. They weren't, quote unquote, technically getting the King James either. They were getting it in Hebrew, but the King James is closer to the Hebrew interpretation, okay? So, I'm just pointing this out, and it makes sense that the interpretations that you all came up with would be what you came up with based on what you read here. It makes sense that you would do that. Well, let's go over to the King James Version, and let's go through the same thing and see what we come up with. So we have a prayer of Moses, the man of God. We've already established this was Moses before the church. So we can't be talking about the church, can't be talking about Gentiles, can't be talking about the people of today. He's talking about his people. So the scripture has to be about the Jews. Key important idea. So we have Lord. And then I told you, anytime you see the word Lord, who are we talking about? Jesus. It is the word Adonai, A-D-O-N-A-I. My dog is named Adonai, A-D-O-N-A-Y. Why? She has a problem saying Adonai, so I had to switch it to Adonai. And the spelling confused everybody with an I on the end, so I put a Y to make it easier for people to read. But our dog is named the Lord. So that's where I got that from. Now, Adonai, remember, Jewish tradition was that every year they'd have a Adonai goat and they would send him out to the wilderness to die with the sins of the people. So that's where that comes from. Also, the Jews felt that the word Yahweh, which is the formal name of God, was too holy and they would not say it. That's why when you see Yahweh, it doesn't have the vowels in it, so it's impossible to pronounce. It's four consonants. You can't pronounce a word in the human language that doesn't have a vowel in it. Now, now the interesting thing about it is if you read Hebrew, Hebrew is all consonants. The jots and the tittles, the marks on top is what adds the vowels to it. So just I don't know if you knew that, but that's how it works. When they were calling Lord, it was the personal name of God every time they said Lord. And the reason is, is we know that the word Lord, it is Jesus, but it's God interacting in the three-dimensional. That's what is dealing with the earth. They're calling the Lord formally by his name. So the Lord would be equivalent to Emmanuel. And that's what they're saying. They're calling him by his name. We think of it as just a holy name, but it's the personal name of God. The reason is they were physically interacting with part of the Godhead. It was Jesus Christ. They were seeing him face to face when they were talking to him. When Moses went into the tabernacle, it says that he looked right into the eyes of God and then he says, I want to see your holiness. And then he was put in the cleft of the rock. The scriptures later say that any man that looks upon the face of God will die, will perish. How could that be? It's a contradiction. How could he look in the eyes of God and then a couple of verses later it says any man that looks into the eyes of God will die. It was the Father he couldn't look at. Jesus, he was looking at because he could interact in the, that. So that's the Lord. Thou has been our dwelling place in all generations. The Jewish term for generations is not the word generations, a group of people passing down your lineage to the next generation. It's an indeterminate period of time in the Hebrew. How do I know this? If you haven't, I would encourage you to do this. You may have heard, have anybody ever heard of a keyword Bible? Keyword Bible. This is a King James version of it, and all through it you'll see words that are underlined, and they will have numbers on it by the word. So as an example, this one says testimony, and it has a number 8584. I just randomly picked up a passage here. What that underlined word is, it's the Hebrew word that was interpreted into English, and then you can get a keyword dictionary that actually gives the definition of the actual Hebrew word. 
So, if I'm reading my Bible and I pull this one out and match it, I'll see that generations has a particular number by it. I can look it up here and find out what does the actual Hebrew word mean. And you will find that it's not generations, a lineage of people, it's an indeterminate period of time in the actual Hebrew. So, again, what we're going to find continuously through here, what you think you're reading, has nothing to do with the Hebrew and how it was interpreted. Is the King James 100% accurate? No, because it's using English, which doesn't translate exactly into Hebrew or back and forth. The example I always gave you before was the word love. We have one word for all forms of love. Hebrew has all kinds of different words, and so does Greek, to show the different degrees. We know that the greatest love of all is what type of love? Agape love, self-sacrificing love. I give up my life for another. The greatest love that you can give to anyone. But we also have things like Husted love, which is steadfast love. The Father will never turn his back on you. Will you be thrown into hell? If you disobey him, you will be. Will he still love you? Absolutely. Does it break his heart that he throws you into hell? Absolutely. But will he? Absolutely, because he's righteous and just. But they're both the words love. Well, in Hebrew, you have these variations, so when the people wrote the King James, they're using English the best that they could and came up with the best interpretation, but it's not exact. So if you're going to do it, you still got to go back to the Hebrew if you're going to understand it. Remember Jesus after the resurrection, and they were out, and he goes to Peter and says, will you feed my sheep? Will you feed my sheep? And he kept asking him, do you love my sheep? And when we read it in English, he's like, of course I love your sheep. And he says, will you love my sheep? Of course I love it. If you read it in Hebrew, you would say, will you agape my sheep? I like your sheep a lot. Do you love my sheep? I like them a lot. Will you love my sheep to the point that you'll sacrifice your life for my flock out there, Peter? I get it. I'll agape them. And he's like, yeah, that's it. When you understand that, man, that scripture entirely changes. I'm sure the first time you read it, he says he loves it. Why do you keep asking that? Yes, I love it there. You can't get it out of English. You see what I'm saying there? Yes. It says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all our generations. So Jesus has been with the Jews ever since they were the Jews, right? Start with Abraham, set him apart, and been with them ever since. Before the mountains were brought forth, or over thou hast formed the earth and the world. We know the mountains were brought forth when? Millions of years ago? I told you one of our first two classes, and we get this from Genesis. When were the mountains formed? During the time of Peleg, remember? There's that little scripture in the genealogy there. It says, there's a little scripture and a little parenthesis and it says that's when the mountains were formed during Peleg's time. He was like the fourth generation. When the earth was created, and the earth by definition is what? The planet? According to the Bible, what is the earth? It's the dry land. The planet was already here. In Genesis that we have, it's not the creation. Genesis 1.1 is the creation of the heavens and the earth. It says, in the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Second one, he says, then there was a void. And then in verse 3, it says, then he started recreating the earth there. It had already been created one time. It already existed. It was just all covered up by water from Lucifer's flood. And then he brought the land out of it, and then he separated the water into the firmament above and below. There was the oceans on the earth, and then there was a layer all over the earth. And that's one reason why people lived longer, is radiation didn't penetrate through it, so you didn't die from radiation the way that we do today. And when Noah's flood came, that's where the rains came. It came out of that firmament that was around the earth and just dropped down. That's where all that water came from. Because all the excess water had to go somewhere when he pulled the land out of it. Where did he do it? He stuck it up in the sky. So how far up? You know, 10, 15 miles. I don't know what it was, but that's where it was. And it says, and then he formed the earth, he formed the land and the world. Is God redundant? Remember before I told you sin and iniquity, people always thought they were the same words. Sin is the intent. Iniquity is the action that follows. That's why you see sin and iniquity. He's not redundant and just repeating himself. So if that's the case, is earth and the world mean the same thing? Because we already established earlier that's what we thought it was. It was the planet. The world, the Greek word is cosmos. It's a social order. He created the physical earth, the land, and he created the people who live in the land, the world, the social order the civilization that lived in it. So he created both of them. And from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. We think everlasting and everlasting as being eternity. The Greek word actually means from generation to generation the word above, which is an, a time period. So it's not that it was forever, and again we're looking at the context of the scriptures, it's from when the earth and the world were first created, which wasn't millions of years ago. How long ago was Adam and Eve created approximately? 
6,000 years ago. From the everlasting to everlasting, from this dispensation to the end of the dispensation, Jesus was going to be with them. Remember, I told you that the Bible has clues about other things. It talks about Lucifer and his reign on the earth, not a lot, but it was the world that then was, that's mentioned in scripture and locations. It was before Adam and Eve, and he rebelled against God. Lucifer was in charge of the earth. He rebelled, God flooded the earth, destroyed everything there, and he recreated the earth in Genesis. The Bible, as we read it, is only about 7,000 years. There's more, obviously, of history, but this is all that matters to us because it's the world that was created, which we're part of, which is only 6,000 years old. So that everlasting to everlasting isn't millions of years, it's 7,000 years. We're approximately at 6,000 years. There's 1,000 years left, give or take a little bit. This left, and that's what he's talking about. Can't get it from English, but if you go to the Hebrew, you know exactly what it's talking about. Thou turnest man to destruction, and saith, Return ye children of men. So if he's going to destroy man, how can they return? What we talked about in our NIV version is we're talking about the death of men and they're going back to dust. How can man turn to dust and then return back to God? Once you die, is there a second chance? If you have rebelled against God and you are in a state of sin without repentance and not covered by the blood of Jesus, you die. Is there a second chance? You go to hell to await the white throne judgment. Who says, return ye children of men? Is it Moses saying or somebody else? He's just repeating what this other person said. And who's that other person? God. So God destroys you and he says, come back to me. If God wanted us to go to heaven and the only way you could get to heaven was wings and he didn't give you wings and he says, fall up to me if you want to be saved, would it be realistic? If he destroys you and you become dust, how in the world could he possibly say return? So it can't be what we thought it was talking about, is it? You can't do the impossibility. When he says destruction and you go to the word in Hebrew, you will see it is a situation where you have rebelled against God and you're outside the covenant agreement with God. So it says that because you have rebelled and man has turned to destruction, it's not that God destroyed man, man destroyed the covenant between him and God. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree of good and evil, did God separate their relationship or did man? Man did. Man did. This is what he's talking about. Because you have rebelled against me, he says, return back to me. But again, he's not specifically talking about Adam and Eve. He's talking about the Jewish nation. Because you have broken my covenant and rebelled against me, I want you to come back to me, Jews. And ultimately, there has been a time gap since the death of Christ, and it's been approximately 2,000 years. Have the Jews been punished because of their rebellion? In what way? First is the dispersion, okay, the great disappora. Now, obviously, the consequences of that have led to things like Hitler's Holocaust and things like that. They've received punishment. But has God given up with the Jews? Now, remember what I told you, three things with the new modern versions. They teach eternal security. They downplay the power of the Holy Spirit and the supernatural, and they also do what? What was the third thing I told you? They teach replacement theology. Exactly what you're seeing here. They didn't want to talk about the Jews and the fact that God says, come back to me, Jews. They completely turn it around and change the subject. You see what's happening here? <laughs> God says, you broke your covenant with me, but I haven't given up with you. You're still the apple of my eye, Jews. Come back to me. So, for a thousand years is thy sight, or but as yesterday when it was passed. Now, the thousand years, he's given a time frame. What he's talking about, and you've got to put it in the context of other scriptures, but we know that because of their rebellion, he has dispersed them all throughout the world. But he's telling them right here how long you're going to be gone, guys. He's setting up the time frame. A day is like a thousand years. The seven days of creation are equivalent to the total time frame of man and the salvation plan. It's that 7,000 years. We're at 6,000. There's going to be a rapture, and then we're going to have a thousand year millennial reign of Christ at 7,000 years. He's telling them, because Moses is asking, we know we're away from you, God. When are we going to come back to you? Have you given up on us? And God's saying, no, I want you to return back to me. And he's setting up the time frame to let people know this is how long it's going to be, but I am going to bring you back to me. So now you're starting to get the prophetic part of this. You see where I'm going. So he says, for a thousand years in the sight or but a yesterday when it was past. The past is not a past time. The past, if you look at the Hebrew word, is when they actually violated the covenant and rebelled against God. And as a watch in the night, 
the Hebrew word for night is not night a time frame when there's absence of light, but it's talking about the despair of man when you're at the very lowest point. Again, you can't get this out of English, but he's saying that when you rebelled against me and you are forlorn and you're discouraged because you don't have a relationship with me, that's what he's talking about. And he says, because of that, thou hast carried those away like with a flood. They were as a sheep. In the morning they are grass which groweth up. So he's setting this up and he's basically telling them that because of your rebellion, I'm going to disperse you like a flood. You're going to be taken all over the place. And just like a sheep who's wandering without a shepherd, you're going to be like that. Now he's switching the subject and he's starting to answer his question. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth, groweth up. In the evening it was cut down and withereth. And then it goes on. On, and he's basically saying there is a time where you're going to come back again and in the beginning you're going to grow up just like the grass but eventually it's going to terminate also. It's going to wither eventually. It's going to be cut down. It's going to end. But now he's talking about this. For we are consumed by thy anger and thy wrath that we are troubled. Thou set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of their countenance. Moses is just like Daniel. He's acknowledging the sin of the people and saying that we understand we're out of your graces, God. He's saying that he understands that there's a consequence to it. Verse 9 says, For all of our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. He's not talking about death of an individual people. He's talking about the nation of Israel was dead because it was dispersed and it didn't exist anymore. And he says, which is quite telling, we spend our years as a tale that is told. The Old Testament is a tale that explains all of that and it's quite interesting that this was given to Moses because at this point they had already been in captivity with the Egyptians for how long? 400 years. So it's during this period of time that he's talking about this, but we know that our numbers, again we've already talked about in the other scriptures, that it was 70 to 80 years. So God is telling him not about the end of the 400 year period because Moses is saying, we're out of your graces, we understand we're in captivity, just like Daniel did. We know we're in Babylon, we're in captivity. When are we coming out of here, Lord? And we know later from Jeremiah that that time period is 70 years, but it can't be Moses' time because Moses was there for 400 years. And he says it's gonna be 70, maybe 80, but that's how long that you're going to come back and exist there. But the reason why they were dispersed, and Moses acknowledges, we are consumed with thy anger and the wrath that were trouble. You set your iniquities, our actions before you, and our secret sins, our thoughts, our intents, you see by your countenance in the light of your countenance, okay? You can't hide anything from God. He knows what they were doing and he rebelled against them. Then it says, the days of our years are three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow is soon cut off and we fly away. So we've established it cannot be Egypt captivity that he's talking about. What's the next captivity? And I already talked about it. Daniel and Babylon. Now we know they were in captivity for 70 years, correct? Was it 80? We have the luxury of time to know that it wasn't 80 years, it was 70 years. But God says it will be 70, but through strength you might make it 80 years, but not 70. That scripture that Daniel did, did he base it on this scripture, or did he base it on some other scripture to come up with? Why was Daniel even praying to God, and why did the angel come and deliver a message to him? Because Daniel was asking him, when are we coming back, Lord? I acknowledge the sin of our people, but we're coming back. Because Daniel, because at the beginning of it, it said in Daniel, what book was he reading before he started praying and fasting? It actually mentions that after studying the book of Jeremiah, he went to him. And he was looking at the scriptures where it said that you'll go in there. Because remember, the reason why God led them into captivity is they were disobeying God and not letting the land rest every seven years. And they did it through seven cycles. And because of that, it ended up being 70 years is why he punished them 10 years for each time he violated the command not to rest the land. So he was looking at that. So it wasn't the scripture. This has to apply to something else. And we look, what he's talking about here is the nation of Israel right now. And we're going to know this because in a few scriptures I'll explain to you why. But the 70 years is from the formation of Israel in 1948. And the scriptures, 70 years from 1948 is what? 2018. Israel is going to end in the year 2018 or 
because of strength. And it's not the strength of the Jews, it's the strength of their opponents which will dictate it. It may go for 80 years to 2028, but that's what he's talking about here. Now, people say, well, Steve, you're trying to set the date of the rapture. No, I'm not because it could be anywhere in between 2018 and 2028. I don't know if you knew, but I have said in this class that I personally believe the rapture is going to happen in two or three years. There's a reason I always said that, guys, is because I knew the scripture and you didn't there. And it may be between 2018 and 2028. And even if it happens in 2018, do I know what the date in 2018 is going to be? No. But you look at events that are happening around the world that accelerate, and I told you the events leading up to God and God are right upon us, guys. If this doesn't open your eyes and get you to start looking up for the blessed hope, the time is there. God gave to Moses the timeline when this is happening, because let's keep on going. Yet is there strength in the labor and sorrow? The Jews are going to continue to try to extend the life of the nation, but they're not going to be able to. If you look at the sorrow and the labor, it's effort that is done in vain according to the Hebrew. Even though they're going to try to extend it to 80, they probably aren't going to make it. It's probably going to be 70. And then it's cut off. And then the key words, because you didn't explain this away in your explanation. And what are the last three words of that verse? Violin. Which is? Rapture. The rapture, baby. Because did the Jews back in Egypt fly away? Nope, they wandered for 40 years in the desert. Jeremiah, did they fly away when they came out of Babylon? Nope, they wandered back and they had to fight and build the temple back again and they were there for, for quite a period of time. 14 generations till Christ came onto the scene and then the 70 AD. And even after that, they didn't fly. They wandered and got dispersed, etc. Now, why do I know that this is tied in? Let's keep going. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to the number of our days that we may apply our hearts into wisdom. Moses is specifically asking us, let us know when this time period is so we can be prepared for it. And it says, Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear upon thy servants, and the glory upon their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. What are they basically saying there? Remember I told you there were four unconditional covenants of God. There was the Abrahamic covenant, there was the Palestinian covenant, there was the Davidic covenant, and there was a fourth one. Do you remember? It was the new covenant. In the book of Jeremiah, God says there will be a time period where I promise you this is a covenant that I have made myself. Doesn't matter what anything happens. Every other covenant that I told you about is conditional. I'll provide the means of salvation, but whether you get the benefit of it, it's up to you whether you accept the work of my son on the cross. I will furnish all of your needs, but nobody ever reads the next part of that scripture which says, if what? If you first seek the kingdom of God. He doesn't promise that he's going to provide for everybody. It's only those who seek his will in their lives. People always say, why do people starve? Because they're not seeking the kingdom of God. Okay, They're going their own ways. God says, if you do this, I'll do this. But the four covenants, he says, it's going to happen because I have decreed it. Jeremiah, the new covenant, says there will be a time period when my people will turn to me and my law will be written on their hearts and they will seek me as a God. We see the ending scriptures of Gog and Magog War. Why do we have the Gog and Magog War? What does the scripture say about it? is to bring glory to him and let the world know that I exist and these are my people. That's the purpose of Gog Magog War. So this is about the Jews. The scripture that says fly away affects us, the church and the Gentile, but this isn't about them. That's when that ends. That's when the nation of Israel, because the tribulation period is bringing this all to an end. And at the midpoint of the tribulation, when the Antichrist shows his true colors and he sets up the abomination of desolation, what does Jesus tell the Jews to do? Flee to the mountains of Judea. Get the heck out of here because Jerusalem and Israel as you know it is over. That's when it ends there. So, based on those scriptures, it would appear that the rapture is going to occur in 70 years and probably the midpoint of the tribulation is going to be about 80 years, about 10 years later. Remember I told you there was going to be an indeterminate period of time for these things to be set up. The last part is Moses saying, tell us what we got to do in order to fulfill Jeremiah's new covenant. That's what he's talking to. If you read it up there, 
the way that those last couple of verses are set up are kind of paralleling what God promised there. Let their work appear to us. Because right now, do the Jews acknowledge that Jesus is their Messiah? No. And Moses is saying, let thy work appear unto the servants and the glory unto their children. He's saying, let the Jews appreciate the work of the cross and the fact that that was you, the sacrificial land. Let them see, let their eyes be opened up so that we can turn that back at. Establish thou work of our hands upon us. The work of our hands establish thou it. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Again, if we know that the Lord is the Adonai, it's Jesus Christ. He's saying, let the Jews realize that the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, let them see it so that they can fulfill the new covenant and come back to us. So what that Psalm 90 is, it's given the timing of when the rapture is coming, guys. And there's no way that you could possibly get that out of the modern translations. So when I study the Bible and I come before you, do you see what I'm going through and what I have to do in order to get the correct scriptures language? Because not only do I know that the modern translations are biased, in this particular case, this was changed because of replacement theology. But second of all, it is knowing that you have people who are using words in English according to the 21st century definition. I got to go back to what the original intent of it was and figure out what that was and then place it in there. So when I tell you studying the Bible is an effort, guys, it's an effort. Most people read this and they spend 20 minutes reading the scriptures. It would probably, especially when you first start off truly doing it, it'd take you three or four hours at the very best to make it through here. Now, one of the things that I plan to do, and I don't know if I'll have time to do it and have the energy to do it, but I've always had a passion to actually write a commentary of the Bible basically explaining what I'm telling you here today. So I don't know if I've lost you today. Is everybody kind of with me? Do you see... How, and I think this is another example, where the interpretation that you read makes all the difference in the world from the message that you're going to get from God. But do you see where these scriptures, when you do this, and this is another reason I tell you to get a parallel version of the Bible, if you read it, you'll see because the words just don't match up when you read it side by side. Now what happens is, unfortunately, they're not going to put the effort to do everything. They'll read the NIV, they'll read the King James, and they'll just ignore the King James because it doesn't match up what they think it should be, and they just kind of close their filters out, and they just kind of look at it. Have I confused everybody, or are you with me? And I didn't purposely set you up to give me the wrong interpretation. I just knew what you were going to come up with ahead of time. I could have told you what you were going to tell me before you did. But I use this as an example because the purpose of me teaching you is not just because I stand in front of you and I like to have you listen to me. I'm trying to transform your mind to make you think like God so that you can read his scriptures and understand what it is he's trying to tell you. That's why you can't do this and why I waited four months, well, five months I've been with you. I could not have done what I did today five months ago. You weren't ready. After hearing me teach for five months, I felt you were at a point where this would make sense to you and you could catch it on. It's line upon line, precept upon precept. You can't rush it. It takes time to get there, and you have to build up a foundation and then start getting into the nuances, etc. That's why, literally, I told you that every time I read the Bible, I pick up a new little nugget all of the time. Now, if it wasn't 2015, what I just taught you today probably could not have been understood back in 1970s. Why? There wasn't enough history to match it up to make sense in regard to it. But if I would have told you that 1975, we're back, say, like George Orwell's 1984, a lot of the principles in that book are in place today. But most of the people really didn't understand it. And a lot of the things that are well in are just everyday things we don't even think about, okay? It's just part of our society and our life. It's just everyday things. It was so inconceivable back in the 30s that most people couldn't get it. Orwell had a foresight that was amazing to see 70 years into the future where we were going. But same thing is with prophecy. Remember, Daniel was told, seal the book up because until the time is right, you're not going to understand what's all in here. This stuff is starting to explode and open up. And even 15 years ago, when I first became a Christian, I don't think if I taught this, I don't know if I would have got it then either, but even if I would have, most people wouldn't have agreed because there wasn't enough history to back it up. People, if I started talking about ISIS in 2001, they wouldn't have believed me, that there was going to be a caliphate in the Middle East. I don't know if you remember when Glenn Beck was on TV and Fox News where they kicked him off, and one of the reasons they kicked him off Fox News because he was talking about the Muslim caliphate, and everybody thought he was a nut, and because of that, they thought he was getting too radical. 
Two years later, we have a caliphate in the Middle East. People just aren't ready until it's time to be told. So any Lord questions? talking to God. Do you think he realized that he was giving future prophecy also? A lot of the prophets were given the mountain peaks, but what they weren't given was the valleys, the time periods in between. They would see events, and they would look like they were just right after each other. As an example, the description of the termination of Israel and then the resurrection and the rapture and the second coming, they are in the same verse separated by a semicolon. They were in reality at least 2,000 years apart, but they didn't see that part. So he was probably thinking in the context of the Egyptian captivity, but God was going beyond that. And he was answering his question, but it was in the long-term period of the Jewish nation, not at the end of that 400-year period. So Moses probably didn't get it. The apostles basically are the ones who carried forth and created the Bible. Jesus would always get frustrated. You a little, fa don't you understand what I'm saying? They, I mean, he kept saying, I'm going to die and be resurrected. They didn't get it, and they were just days away from that. So obviously, most people can't get it until the time is right. So again, as I said, what I'm trying to do is teach you how to teach, because while you may not formally sit in front of a class like I'm doing before you today, you will witness to other individuals, but you have to understand what you're doing. And for you to get the own benefit for your own personal life, you need to truly understand how to read the Bible, because I'm I'm not always going to be there to help you be interpreted. you got to be able to do it for yourselves, guys. So what I'm trying to do is not just teach you a story and facts that you can just like, oh, well, Steve said this and et cetera. I'm trying to help you think like God does. And I'm not saying that because it's anything special, because the guy who teaches me is the same guy that can teach you. It's the Holy Spirit. I didn't get this teaching because I listened to some other guy. I got this teaching because I studied the Word of God with the illumination of the Holy Spirit and praying to God, please show me that. But what I'm trying to do is get you to think God-like, how the Bible is written. That's why it takes effort. Being a Christian is work. It's hard work. It takes a lot of effort. And most people aren't willing to put in the effort. What handful of people that we have here in the class. If I would have said this and someone came in new in the first class, they would probably walk out and never come back in there again and totally be confused and lost. Well, but you were ready. Prophets were thinking Jesus was coming back during their lifetime, and they were teaching that. Yeah. So there is so much information in this book, we just don't understand it. Everything that we need, everything that we need is in here. You just got to learn how to unlock the key to it. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to come together today, Lord. Hopefully nothing came out of my mouth, which was not a direct revelation from you. Lord, as we go forth, let's internalize what we learn and let's teach other people the truth because you are a glorious God. Thank you for dying on the cross 2,000 years ago. Because of our rebellion, you had to, but because of your love and your mercy and your grace, you chose to do so, and we get the benefit of it. Let us never forget that. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.